Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I am ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, this is Station. I have you loud and clear. All right, please stand by for opening remarks. Hestal Halt, I am Jason Adams, board chairman for the Boys and Girls Club of the Flathead Reservation and Lake County. The club works each day to expand the horizons of the kids in our programs, this downlink being one of the highlights of this year. The space station is a long way from the Flathead Reservation, but totally within reach for youth interested in becoming a part of a future in space travel. And now, here's our first question. Hi, my name is Delilah, I am in seventh grade, and my question is, do you celebrate holidays and what do you do to celebrate? Yes, we certainly love to celebrate holidays here on the International Space Station. And we really are an international crew. So we have crew members from all the different countries, different religions, different backgrounds, and everybody celebrates the holidays a little differently. So it's really fun to learn the traditions from my crewmates on what they do to celebrate back home. Um, this year, we all certainly got together, enjoyed a great meal, and shared some fun stories and some good laughs. Hello, my name is Avery Grandchamp. I am in the fifth grade, and my question is, how do you guys keep yourself entertained? It is certainly not a problem to keep yourself entertained. Not only are you incredibly busy during the day conducting science experiments, maintenance on the International Space Station, and getting prepared for activities such as spacewalks, but when you do have some free time, just floating in space is fun. You can see I'm just floating here, not touching anything. And so it's really fun to see how your body reacts in microgravity, how things are so different. One of the coolest things that I think in microgravity is how water responds. So this is a drink bag, and unlike on Earth, where water would just fall to the ground, uh, water in space will just form a ball. Because of the surface tension of the water, it's much different. And so I'm gonna come a little closer so you can see. So you can see this ball of water just forms. And so it's fun to look through the water. You can see yourself inverted. It's fun to try to stick, you know, M&Ms or one of my favorite is Swedish fish in the water and you can see it float around then you can just eat it. So it's definitely, uh, definitely busy and definitely a lot of fun. Hi, my name is Aiden Franklin. I, I'm in eighth grade. My question is, how many experiments have failed? There are a ton of experiments on the International Space Station. Right now, we have over 250 ongoing experiments. Now, sometimes you may send up an experiment and you have an idea of the results that you're gonna get. And if you don't get those exact results, that's not necessarily a failure because you still have a lot of knowledge gained from that experiment. Uh, a lot of the tests, Tests that we do are technology development. So we're trying to figure out how to live and operate in space so that we can live and operate in deep space on the moon and eventually on Mars. And so each time we conduct an experiment, we always learn something. Now, space is a difficult environment, and the experiment needs to make it all the way up here through the launch loads and the environment that it has to go through to get to the International Space Station. Uh, sometimes we have some science that has certain conditions, like it has to stay a certain temperature. Um, when we had a visiting vehicle called Cygnus come up, we had a problem with one of the solar arrays. So unfortunately, we had to power down some of the lockers that keep some of the science cold. In that case, we lost the science, and hopefully it will be flown, though, on another resupply vehicle soon. I'm Donna, grade 7. How do you keep from floating away when you exercise?
That is a great question because as you see, I'm just kind of bouncing around here. And if I went to go do a squat and I pushed off, I would move just with the same amount of force that I pushed off to the ground. So we have a couple devices. Well, see, I missed it right there that help keep us attached. Uh, we can run on a treadmill and we wear a harness like a backpack that has bungees. And so you run and that keeps you connected to the ground. Uh, we have a bike where you clip in with bicycle shoes, but there's no seat because you don't need a seat since there's nothing to sit on. And so you just kind of pedal. Uh, around the bike and we have a box that provides the resistance. And then our weightlifting machine is vacuum tubes instead of weights. And so you can dial up the uh, and increase the vacuum in those tubes, which will increase the load. And it's like a universal weightlifting machine. So you have that bar on your back and then as you push up, you're working against that vacuum. And that's how we uh, exercise and uh, keep ourselves healthy while we're in space. Hi, my name is Haley. I'm in the eighth grade. And my question is, what do astronauts do when someone is sick? So before we fly to the International Space Station, we quarantine for two weeks so that we don't bring up any type of germs or anything to get the crew sick on board station. So you don't have a cold or you don't have the flu and there's no COVID up here. So that, that part's great. But you can still have medical problems. You can get rashes and itches. And so we have... Uh, everybody has a level of a medical training to provide help to our crewmates. And we have medication packs on board with medicine in case we needed it. And of course, we have a great team of folks on the ground that support us, our flight surgeons. And if we have any type of issues, we talk to them about the issues. And we have some imaging devices on board that can look at your eyes, an ultrasound machine, and they're able to come on board with a camera, just like you're looking at me now. And we would do an ultrasound on each other, and then the doctors could uh, look at that ultrasound as an example. Hi, my name is Rosalie. I'm in the seventh grade, and my question is, what is the most dangerous job astronauts have to do? I would say living and operating in the vacuum of space um, is a pretty dangerous job. Now, fortunately, we have a huge team of folks on the ground, engineers and scientists and safety folks that make it as safe as possible. And we try to mitigate all the risk. Uh, one thing that we do that elevates that risk, and we have a lot of training for it and a lot of preparation, is when we go on a spacewalk. So in a spacewalk, we put on a suit and you go outside the International Space Station, and you're going out to conduct a task of either repairing the space station or maybe making an upgrade. Uh, those missions are usually six to seven hours long. You're outside with another crew member um, climbing around the International Space Station, executing these maintenance tasks. It's very critical, the work that you're doing, everything that you have is tethered down so you don't lose anything out in space. It's really important that you work together and help each other out because it's really just, or it is just the two of you out there to get the uh, mission done. I'm Jamie, I'm in the seventh grade, and my question is, what do you wish was up there in space with you right now? Let's see. Right now, I wish I had my son with me. He is 10 years old, and he would love being in space. And I think that we would just have an incredible time being in microgravity. And there's so many things that I could show him and so many experiments we could do. It would be fun just to try to play catch in zero G. It's very different when you try to throw a ball because on Earth, you naturally compensate for the gravity. So when you throw a ball, you don't throw it straight at somebody, right? If you were to throw a football, you would throw it up. It would make an arc for you to come catch it. If you try to do that in space, when you release the ball, it's just going to flow in the direction that you released it. I'll show you with my drink bag. So if I threw in this direction, it's going to go straight up. So it would be a little bit of a challenge, but I think it would be a lot of fun. My name is Lauren Olson. I'm in eighth grade. And my question is, how do you organize all the cords up in space? 
There are cords everywhere on the International Space Station. There are so many computer systems and technical devices that are hooked up. They need power, they need data, and I'm looking right now, I can see over 100 cords. So it's important that you keep those organized, one, so that you don't catch your toe on them as you're floating by, um, and also so that you don't accidentally unplug something that would then lose power. So we use Velcro. You can see I'm wearing pants right now that have been modified for space, and I have Velcro all over these pants. So Velcro is used to wrap around the cords to keep them secure. You can see it's also used for my drink bag here. And I just stick the Velcro to my pants. Um, we also have other types of tethers that we use. Now this tether specifically is for a spacewalk, but we have similar types of tethers or bungee cords that we use to keep equipment secure. This tether is a retractable um, equipment tether. And so you can see this cord will retract back. And so if you have a large piece of equipment that's hooked to this hook and the other piece of the hook is connected to you, then it won't go too far. You can see it'll come back to you. So it's definitely important, uh, especially when you're outside the space station, that everything is tethered down, but also inside the space station so things don't float away. I'm Vance. I'm in sixth grade. And how do you keep the power from going out? So we have solar arrays on the International Space Station, and these huge arrays collect the energy from the sun, and they store it in batteries. So when the space station has the sun shining on it, the arrays are controlled to capture all that energy. And then at, during a night pass, when the space station can't see the sun, it's on the other side of the Earth, then we can use the energy from the batteries to power the space station. In fact, we're doing spacewalks, so right now we have been for the past couple of years, to upgrade some of these solar arrays so that we can provide more power to the International Space Station to be more efficient because as technology increases and improves, so does our requirement for power with all the computer systems that are on board. My name is Brantley. I'm in sixth grade and my question is, do you guys do anything that includes nuclear fusion? So we don't have any experiments right now on board the International Space Station with anything nuclear, but NASA is certainly working on nuclear fusion experiments and technology development really for deep space travel. So if you think about traveling from all the way from Earth to Mars, right now with current technology and, and depending on the location of Mars relative to Earth, that could take six to nine months. And during that time, you need to protect the science and the astronauts that are on board. So if we can figure out a way to get astronauts to the space station, or to Mars, excuse me, faster, and to do that with less mass that's required, because it takes a lot of energy just to break free of Earth's gravity. Uh, so if we can uh, figure some of those problems out, maybe uh, nuclear propulsion is one of those options that we'd be able to use in deep space travel. My name is Hadassah and I'm in fourth grade. And my question was, are your dreams different in space? You know, I had that same question before I traveled to space. And my dreams are very similar to dreams on Earth. Although a lot of times I'll dream about what I'm looking forward to or what I'm doing during the day. And since that has to do with microgravity and floating around, I have a lot of dreams about that. But the other night I had an interesting dream. I had a dream that I was back in my room on Earth and I wanted to jump up and touch the corner of the room. So here in space, I just light push off and I can touch the ceiling and push back down and it's really easy. But in the dream, I went to push off and gravity pulled me back down to the ground. And I remember feeling disappointed that I was feeling gravity again and that I was no longer in microgravity. But then when I woke up and realized I was still in the space station, I was pretty excited. Hi, my name is Bella, I'm in fourth grade. And my question is, do you ever get tired of space? 
I have been up here almost or just over four months and I have definitely not gotten tired. There's so much to do and so much to experiment with. Um, we also have this incredible module called the cupola. And the cupola is a series of windows and it's on the bottom part of space station and so it's pointing towards Earth. And that is an incredible uh, view to have of our planet Earth. So sometimes when I have some free time, I like to go into the cupola and just look out at our beautiful planet. The other day, we were passing over Montana and I could see the Flathead Indian Reservations. I could see Glacier National Park going up into Canada and it was just beautiful. You will pass over the entire United States in just a matter of minutes because we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. And so it's really incredible to see all the different landscapes and all the different colors of the many different places all around our planet. Hi, my name is Owen. I'm in sixth grade. And can you have pets in space? Unfortunately, we cannot bring our live pets to space. I wish, that would be wonderful. Um, I have a dog and it would be really funny to see him floating around in microgravity. Um, but we do bring little animals, so each crew will have a, we call it a microgravity indicator. And sometimes that's an animal that is a name for your class. So the astronaut class uh, that came after me, their name is the turtles. And so they flew up a little turtle. And, uh, and I did bring a little special um, pet with me that's a stuffed animal. It's a little penguin. And uh, my son has a penguin at home. And so we got a little penguin. We call him Penguin 2.0. And he's with me here on the International Space Station. Hi, my name is Y Bogard. I am in seventh grade. And my question is, how, many, how much fuel does it take to get to the space station? That is actually a very complicated answer. It's dependent upon uh, where the space station is and what your phasing is to get to space station, what kind of rocket we're using, and what your payload is. And your payload is how much mass that you're sending up from Earth to the International Space Station. And so there's, I rode on a Falcon 9 rocket, and uh, my other crewmates uh, launched on a, on a Soyuz spacecraft from Kazakhstan, and so they flew on a different rocket. And you've probably seen other launches with uh, satellites or other spacecraft that are going into space. We just launched, uh, just a couple months ago, Orion, which was on an SLS rocket. And that is the largest rocket that we've launched since the Saturn V rocket. Now that's taking Orion all the way to the moon, um, but you'll see that that rocket is much larger than a Falcon 9 that I launched on to get to the International Space Station. So there's a lot of variables uh, to determine how much uh, propellant that you'll need uh, for a launch. And hopefully if you become an engineer when you grow up, you can help solve some of those problems. I'm Kira and um, I'm in fourth grade, and how do you wash your hair? So washing your hair and taking a shower in space is challenging because like I showed you, you can't turn on the water to take a shower. That would just form a huge ball of water. So in space, what we do is we have some no rinse shampoo that we use. Um, after you use it for a couple days, it gets kind of gunky in your hair. So then we'll take water and just kind of rinse out your hair. And the water is the same water we use from those drink bags. You can just squirt the water on your hair and then you can just kind of work it through so that it gets wet. But you have to use a, a towel to dry it and then you kind of air dry the towel. Water is different because you can't wring out your hair or wring anything out. So you can see if I take water and put it on this towel here. So the water absorbs into the towel. And on Earth, I would just kind of wring it out. But you can see, I can twist the towel and the water doesn't go anywhere. In fact, the water behaves kind of like, like a gel or something. Um, so you can see, if I come close, I'm gonna put some water on my hand. And you can see how the water just sticks to my hand. And if I open my fingers, you can see the water in between my fingers. It's kind of like, like I have webbed fingers. 
and it feels like water on my hand and you can see it kind of just moves around. So no showers in space, but you can get yourself pretty clean because you can put water, you know, on your, your hand and your body and then you just use a towel to uh, dry it off. On behalf of the Boys and Girls Club of the Flathead Reservation in Lake County, it has been an honor to be a part of this experience. Thank you, NASA, and the team that made this possible. Lem Lemsh. Thank you so much. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all the participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.